develop the foreign power that this organization is talking about so that we can bring the people across this country together for one thing in mind, and that is to build enough product that the industry will pay the prices that we're after. Foreign power and what is it? Foreign power is nothing more than bringing together the resources of agriculture, namely people, production, and the finance to back up the system so that we can develop a power block so formidable that no part of the industry can break that farm power block, no part of the industry can destroy it, and no part of the industry can get along without the product that is going through the system that that farm power block has developed to a point that they must sign contracts for cost of production plus a reasonable profit that you people have to offer. This booklet that's being passed out has to do with the bringing together of one of those three, and that is namely the people. The young farmers across this country have, I think, about three things that they are concerned about. Number one, how could they pay their bills and still remain independent as far as farming, uh, farming operation goes? Number two, they are concerned about government controls. They want to produce and they want to produce fence row to fence row. Number three, they are concerned that if we get a fair price for our commodities, are we not going to price ourselves out of the market and lose the markets we now have to move the products that we produce in our farming operations? These issues are confusing to them, and this booklet that you have in your hands will give you the ability to visit with these young farmers and show them that there is a way in which they can continue to produce independent, as independent operators, by getting fair prices, that they can produce all the commodity they can possibly produce without controls on the production, and it can show them that they don't have to worry about pricing themselves out of the market because we are not producing enough commodity in this country at the present time nor in the foreseeable future to keep us from getting the prices we're after. There's two reasons why this book is written mainly. Number one, it gives the person that's visiting the, visiting the farmers out there contacting them, those that are not yet members of this organization. It gives you the ability to go there with confidence knowing what you're going to say when that door opens up to that farmer that you're going to make the presentation to. It's all written in this booklet and if you yourselves have the confidence in knowing what you're going to present, it makes your presentation a lot better because you have the confidence, your attitude is going to be such that you're going to sell yourself and the organization that you're talking about to that person. That's why this booklet is so very important. You've got it. Don't fold it up. Don't throw it away. Take care of it. Keep it neat. Take it home and use it. I'm going to go through it very quickly because the time does not allow to go through it as I hope you will go through it when you're making your presentation. On the first three pages of this booklet are graphs. And if you will follow along with that booklet on page two, the American Dairy Success, on page three, All Red Meat, and on page four, it points out there the grain that was produced in 1977, 1978 crop, mainly wheat. On all three of those graphs, you will see they are sources. The sources where we got the information from are from the Department of Agriculture. All three of those graphs show that we have not been producing enough milk. We have not been producing enough red meat in this country to feed our people. The consumption is above the supply. 
And as far as the wheat is concerned, which is by far our largest production of any grain commodity, it shows in here how the wheat supply that is produced is broken down into who buys and who uses how much of our wheat each year. It shows in there that if we put the 30% of the production together, that no part of either the feed, the domestic consumption, or the exports can get along without part of that 30%, which would put the wheat producers in a position to name their price once the supply is used up outside of the organized group. Those first three pages, what you're doing is pointing out to your person you're talking to. You're pointing out to them, showing them that we don't have enough supply today to feed our own people in this country. So why worry about the surplus holding our prices down? We shouldn't have to have less than fair prices today if the marketing system was operating as it should be. The next page in page five is the fall of the American farmer. There it shows that parity has gone down from 53% to nine, in 19, or uh, has gone down from 84% in 1953, down to 70% of parity in 1978. Go on to page six, and on page six, what you're doing is you're going to get him to tell you that farmers can get a fair price, and he doesn't know it yet, but read him that page, and I want to point this out. This booklet is designed so you don't have to memorize it. All you've got to do is get the husband and the wife to sit down at a table where you can look them straight in the eye, read this booklet word for word to them, have them follow along, because the total story is in there. If you want to memorize it, that's great. If you want to build your personality around this book and put your own thoughts in this book, it's fine. But stay with the basic parts of this book and what it explains. I'm not going to read each page, but page six I am going to read because it is for a significant reason. What you're doing is getting that person to say that farmers can get a fair price. Supposing one person out of 1,500 owned 30 percent of 34% of all the beef. Do you think he could determine his price to the other 1,500 people? Supposing one person out of 1,500 owned 60% of all the soybeans, do you think he could determine his price to the other 1,500 people? The man you're, persons you're talking to are going to have to admit, yes, they possibly could. And when you go on to the next page, what you've done on the page before is got that person to say, yes, I'm sure they could and then go on to the next page and point out to him that the farmer is that one out of the 1,500. And he's already told you before you turn the page that they could price their commodity. And then go on. Read the page, point out to them how much production the farmers in this country produce, which will show them that we have the vast amount of production throughout the world that we can't possibly price ourselves out of the market since we are the major source of supply. On page 8, on page 9, and on page 10, is the key to the entire organizational basic fundamentals, and that is it shows how farmers supply the industry today in the old marketing system, how they can get themselves in a position to get the industry in a position to have to negotiate contracts with you, the member. Very simple, in pictures, where that person can understand it. On page 11, it points out very clearly what happens to the industry when we get them in a position to bargain and how they can go about writing a contract for your production. And on page 11, that's when you make your first close. Processors will negotiate contracts with producers only when they can't get their needs from the regular sources. NFO has the structure to achieve collective bargaining nationwide. It makes sense, doesn't it? Won't you help? And when you close and ask them to help, you keep your mouth shut, don't say another word, look them in the eye, and remain silent as long as they don't say anything. The one that talks first is going to lose. 
And if he says, no, I don't think I'm going to join today, all you've got to do is go on to the next page. And after the next page, you read it, you close them again. At the end, you say, won't you, can't you, won't you get together with me and the other farmers across this country? Won't you join? And then they remain silent. If he breaks the silence and says, no, I won't join today, you go on to the next page. You read the next page, you close again. If he does not join at that time, you read the next page and close again. You continue to do that all the way through until the end of this booklet. You've got everything in this booklet you need to make your presentation, get him to understand what nationwide collective bargaining is all about through the National Farmers Organization. You've got everything in here to make your point before each one of your closes. And you've got a chance to close the man seven times, the people seven times in this booklet. At the end, if you don't at that time get him to become a member of this organization, you haven't lost it all. Because what you've done is you planted the seed in their mind that they now understand that they can have a chance in organizing because we don't have an overproduction. They understand now the very simple basic principles of what it takes to get the processing industry in a position to have to negotiate contracts with farmers that are organized. You're showing him how they can be organized and you've also shown him, them, that they don't have to fear getting themselves in a position where they're going to be tied down under production controls. Because on page 15 and page 16 are two pages that are very, very important and interesting to the young farmer out there in the country. Something that's been added to this booklet from last year. Steady it and know what it means. The final page of this booklet, the nationwide collection dispatch and delivery system is the last close you've got. And if you don't have a member at that time, what you do is just, is you thank him for his attention, ask him if you can't come back another time and then leave. But remember, you planted a seed, and don't forget to go back and cultivate it. Ladies and gentlemen, it's all the time I want to take it with you tonight with this booklet. But remember to keep this booklet, use it, it's your ammunition to put the people, the farmers across this country into this farm power block that we all know we need to build. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. We don't want anyone to get nervous about the meeting that's scheduled for 8 o'clock because we're going to have a preview. The secretary is going to be in here before he goes in there. So don't get anybody get nervous about the next meeting, and uh, he'll be here with us uh, shortly. Now, inasmuch as this is an all-commodity organization, we'd like each of the departments to give a very uh, a thumbnail sketch of their programs uh, what they have to offer you as the young farmers and ranchers and the potential leaders within this organization. And we'll start out first with hogs, go to grain, and then to dairy. So, Alan, if you'd come up representing the hog department, director of the hog department. Thank you. Well, it's indeed an honor to stand in front of this group because probably 10 years ago tonight I sat in one of those seats. I was elected to the National Board and at that point in time I was one of the youngest members on that board. I had started farming, started with probably 25 cows, ended up with 100 cows, expanded, bought more land and continued to expand and build. I'm well aware of the cash flow problems that we face. With that thought in mind, I have never lost that desire to price agricultural products. I want to do that so bad you can almost taste it. I think now we have got a plan in the hog department that is going to be able to write us a floor price next year. We've got a pretty good shot at it. 
we have had several companies that have indicated they will talk to us on the basis of a floor price contract for hogs. So on that basis, I am asking every young man in this room that is raising hogs to put their, their name on that list and line up five of their people to work with them in those, in those counties back home, the two county people. There is nothing better that you can do for yourself or your industry than that. I say that because I was there. Some of you expressed concern earlier about the size of your operations and about, oh, maybe I don't have time and all of this and that and the other thing. But what more value is spent two or three or four hours a week pricing the products on that entire investment than spend that same time watching the tube or something else. What would be more important to you as a hog producer to sit down with your neighbor and compare a contract that we had negotiated or make a proposal for a new contract? Folks, we did that back when I started in this thing, and we're still doing it. But it's real because those hours spent could mean literally thousands of dollars in your pocket. Now, looking at the hog program per se, we have written contracts with Wilson and Company, with Morell and Company, Frederick Harrod in Detroit, Armour and Company. We have one pending with Swift and Company, and this week we met with the agent from two uh, big eastern packers, and by all indications, it looks like that's going to go. Three of those companies have said they would sit down in good faith and negotiate floor price, and those negotiations are going on. So as we look into 1979, I think we're going to see a year that's going to be second to none as far as negotiating. Now what does it all mean? We had three producers sitting in the hog booth yesterday that raised approximately 10,000 head of hogs apiece. Now, those are pretty substantial people. Some of them have, uh, some of those, per, those size producers are members, some are not. But what that means is this. If you had 74 million FIS slaughter, which is the normal slaughter, and you took producers like that, you would have three rooms full, like we're looking at here tonight, producing all the hogs in the United States. Everyone. That's a fact. So if you take that same 74 million and break it out, and you take the people in the convention and each one put together five, we, we talk about power. You put together those five people with those 4,000 people or 5,000 uh, hog producers that you're talking at, that's 20 to 25,000 producers, and that's 30 to 40 percent of the hogs in the United States. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there is not any one of us that can't put those five people together. And on that basis, and with that power, you'll price hogs at cost of production with a floor in 1979. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Next will be the director of the Grain Department, Ralph Kettleson. Ralph. Thank you, Devon. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here. I've had the pleasure of being in the same position about 10 years ago that I am now as director of the Grain Department. And when I came back and started working again in the Grain Department two, year, or two years ago, what I was most impressed with was what everybody else had learned who had stayed with it all the time. So tonight I'd like to give you a little five-minute presentation about on what is a normal one-hour presentation. Everybody talks about systems. We talk about a structure that we have. But I'd like to just turn it over to a system and make you think about that for a while. Everything that we do it relates to some type of system, whether it's transportation, 
Whether it's a telephone system, Ma Bell says the system is the answer. Postal system, legal system, whatever, everything's a system. We have today in, for the producers of grain, a system. It was set up by the traders, and it works just exactly the way it was set up to work. And that purpose was to get grain into the market for their use any place, anywhere, any time that they needed it. And there's only one way to make that system work. And there's only been three times in recent history that it hasn't worked the way it was set up. And that was in World War I, World War II, and 1973 to 76. And at that time, it became absolute chaos. And the reason it does, and I think in order to explain why the system works the way it does and has to work that way, is we also have to consider how we are as producers. Grain is different than any other product. Meat or milk, they have to go to market on a pretty regular basis. Grain doesn't have to. And the only reason that you will sell grain at any given point generally is for one main reason, and that's to meet your cash flow needs. So when the price comes up in grain, so that you are receiving a decent profit, and you have paid your bills, and then we start wondering, well, what about next year? And what is the income tax going to be? And if we don't need to sell right at that point because we are fat and happy, then the grain trade cannot get the grain any time, any place, anywhere that it needs it. And that's when the system fails. And that's exactly what happened in 72, 73, 74. Their system became absolute chaos. And the only way that their system can work is by forcing it into the market with low farm prices. And it has to be that way. So our system is the only system that can change it. No one else has it in the country. We have the system where we can deliver the product anywhere, any place, any time that they need it under a business-like arrangement, under contract. So there really isn't any choice. Your choice is, if you want to stay with the old system, you're going to have the farm problem 10 years from now if you're around. Or tomorrow morning, you can change it. And we're the only group that can say that. And I am proud to be a part of this organization that has spent the time and the effort and made the mistakes that had to be made to find out what makes this system work and how it has to work. So you don't have a choice. If you really want to solve the farm problem, and you, there is no other way to do it than to use a new system. The first rule in business is if you have a product or a service, you have to learn how to market that product or service. So if we want to look at where the problem is, it's not the government. It's not the grain trade. It's that fellow you look at in the mirror every day. And if we're looking for the enemy, folks, he is us. It's our business, and I am confident today that the acceptance of this organization, the moral fiber of it, the decency of it, can't go any place but up. I think we've got, uh, there's no way we're going to do anything but win. And I'm looking forward to working with all of you and we'll make it happen. Thank you. At this time, the introduction is going to be very short. Our Secretary of Agriculture, Secretary Bob Berglund, is going to talk, and we have many of the young farmers here that are developing into leadership in the organization. Secretary. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ornley. I congratulate you on your courage. Anybody starting farming or planning on starting farming or in the farming business for only a few years 
has probably taken a bigger beating, has probably more cause for worry and concern than any group of human beings in the face of this green earth. And I want to tell you how much you're needed and wanted. And I know anybody who's gone through the last six, eight years with any kind of debt, and most all who start nowadays have big debt, have seen prices of grains go up and come crashing down. Saw livestock prices moving up, and then for four years, five years, one year after another, heavy and sustained and steady loss. The meat grinder was as tough on cattlemen and ranchers as it's been on cattle. And so there's reason for anxiety and concern because many of us wonder if the past is any measure of the future. I don't intend to make a speech here, but I do want to take this opportunity to tell you that the future is better, and I think much better. But it won't come easy, and it won't come automatically. I commend you for taking an active, visible interest in the affairs of the NFO. Orrin Lee didn't tell you this, but I'm, I'm a member of the NFO and have been for ever since it got organized in my county. And I can tell you from my perspective as a member of the President's Cabinet, dealing with tens of millions of people in this country who don't know very much about your business, there's a good deal of misunderstanding around the country. And the kind of mission which you have underway, led by Orrin Lee and your national board and your staff and your state organizations and district organizations, is worth its weight in gold to your future. And so I want to assure you that if there's anything I can do as a Secretary of Agriculture for the United States, in this mission that you have undertaken, this business of providing food and fiber for an increasing number of people around the entire world, for building and preserving the family farm structure of the United States, which is the envy of the world, I'm here to promise that help. I need to know how it should be done, though from you. I'm 50, 50 years old. I've been farming for 28 years. I got my place rented out now to my son-in-law. I tell you, it's a lot easier for me now that I'm 50 and got things pretty well under control than it is for my son-in-law, who's just starting. And so those of us who have been in charge for a while and who have spent a lifetime, I hope I, hope I have some life left to live, but who have spent a good long while at this business, need to be kept reminded. You've got to remind me from time to time. And use, your, use this organization to bring ideas to me in the Department of Agriculture. Bring your ideas to Washington. Bring your ideas to the Congress of the United States. Bring your ideas into this dynamic, hard-hitting organization, the NFO. If you use the power you've got, if you really use your talents and your skills effectively and constructively, there's no limit. And on the other side of the coin, if we disregard these organizations, if we ignore 
the world in which we live. We're going to have a rocky road to hope. So I submit, get organized. Get organized. Get everybody your age into this organization. With this, with organization and speaking with a common voice, together we're going to build the kinds of programs that do make a major and permanent contribution to peace of mind and to building civilized mankind the world over. Thank you very much. We'll now have the Dairy Department give the thumbnail sketch of their programs, Ed Graff, the director. Ed. I don't believe it's even going to be thumbnail. It's going to be just a short comment. This afternoon, we had at our dairy meeting a speaker from Washington, D.C., Mr. Herb Forrest, who is director of the Dairy Division in the Department of Agriculture, and he said, I don't believe any of the farmers want to go back to the days of the 20s before the federal milk marketing order system came into effect. I say to you, we don't want to go back to the days of the 30s or the 40s or the 50s or the 60s or what, we've, what the young farmers facing in the 70s. Well, there's only one thing we need in the National Farmers Organization, the dairy program. And it isn't more or less government controls. It isn't more or less exports or imports. It isn't more or less competition. It's not more or less advertising that we need. It's what the young farmer of America has in his mind, in his heart, and in his body, and that's determination and the volume that he controls. Thank you. Let me just say this. You are today because of your plans of yesterday, and you will be tomorrow because of the plans you make today. We'll adjourn this meeting into the main body of the convention. Thank you. <laughs>